lecture in our winter lecture series this year. Our speaker tonight is Hillary Osborne Malecki. Anybody who knows East Hampton knows that that's one of the founding family names, Osborne. So Hillary can go back to the very beginning of East Hampton with her family. She is a, an expert on history in Wainscot, which is where her family, where she grew up. And she's a member of the board, the East Hampton Historical Society. She's, I'm very excited to hear what she has to tell us tonight. She's going to be talking about the Mulford Farm and the Mulford family, and I'm really excited to see what she has to tell us. So please join me in welcoming Hillary Osborne Malecki. out tonight to the final talk in the East Hampton Historical Society's winter lecture. Tonight we'll explore the history of the Mulford Farm, the house and the farm, the people that lived there, and the story of how the farm transferred from a private home into a museum. a prominent Impressionist painter, lived in East Hampton for over 20 years until his death in 1935. He spent many hours sketching at Mulford Farm. Hassam immortalized the Mulford Farm in this sketch called The Heart of the Hamptons. He wasn't the first to coin the phrase, the town record from 1673 described this land as being in the heart of the town. For for over 300 years, the Mulford House has stood the test of time, weather, and hurricanes to retain much of its colonial character. All the while, the rest of the world has experienced great changes over the last three centuries. The story of the Mulford Farm is a remarkable survivor story. It remains the most intact 17th century building in the village. Few changes have been made to the property since 1750. To have the home, and the barn still standing on their original property is a very rare thing. If you're gonna talk history, I thought I should start with Hugh King, the town crier seen here opening the mill at Home Sweet Home next to the Mulford Farm. I asked Hugh what in his opinion were the three most important things about Mulford Farm. Hugh said, number one, the barn. We still have a barn dating from 1721. How great is that? The Mulford Barn is one of the most intact early 18th century barns in New York State and is recognized as an outstanding example of early 18th century construction methods and materials. Number two, Hugh said we still have a colonial house built in 1680 it's the first thing you see coming into town. You can travel back in time. How great is that? <laughs> the Mulford Farm, listed on the National Register of Historic Places, is considered one of America's most significant intact English colonial farmsteads. And third, Hugh said, we still have an original parcel of land preserved. How great is that? <laughs> Although its acreage has been diminished from approximately 13 acres to just shy of four acres today, it is still reminiscent of the long, narrow lots that characterize a settlement known as Maidstone in the 1600s. Maria Dayton, born and raised in East Hampton, wrote her thesis at the University of Pennsylvania in 2007 on Mulford Farm. She said the early town plan was based on the home lot system, an arrangement in which each family was assigned a plot of land commensurate with how much the family had contributed to purchase the settlement from the Connecticut investors who had acquired the land from the Montauga Indians. Mulford Farm is the last remaining of the original 34 home lots that originally lined Main Street. 
These farms surrounded common pasture lands, the South End Commons known today as the Village Green. The beginning. Cheryl Foster, in a Mulford Farm history, wrote that in the first division of home lots for the first colonial settlers, the property that is now the Mulford Farm was not assigned to anyone. In 1655, six years after the settlement, the town records note the land was finally assigned, given to 24-year-old John Osborne, who was born in Kent, England. John Osborne is a direct descendant of mine, my seventh great-grandfather, and the fact that he lived on this property was unknown to me until I started researching for tonight's <laughs> presentation. <laughs> who knew? <laughs> John and his wife, Miriam Hand, started their family there. They lived on the property for about 15 years, his six with six, having six children, five boys, and one girl born on the farm. Possibly with the impending birth of a seventh child, John was envisioning the need for more farmland for his five sons. Motivated for change, he asked to have this land exchanged for land in Wainscott. The family then moved to Wainscott, where he is credited as a founder there by 1670. This photo, taken in 1889, shows John's Wainscott salt box looking identical to today's Mulford House and Home Sweet Home. The house built in 1675 stood on Wainscott's Main Street until the 1950s. Pictured here are some modern East Hampton blacksmiths after John Osborne removed to Wainscott, the town was now back in possession of the Mulford farmland. The town wanted to rent the land to a blacksmith who would be of service in the community. In 1672, the land, now with a house and shop vacated by John Osborne, was given to a blacksmith in consideration of his trade. However, things did not work out and the blacksmith was off the land within a year. Two more blacksmiths would follow and leave in quick succession. In 1676, the town decided to sell the land to a 44-year-old Captain Josiah Hobart. It was Hobart who built the house from which today's Mulford House descends. Hobart was born in England. He came to East Hampton in the third wave of settlers. The house was built in the style of an English home. It sported casement windows and paired gables on the south-facing roof. It's written that no other house in East Hampton had such an expensive feature that served no purpose except as a status symbol. <laughs> when I look at this house, I think of the story of Isaac Van Scoy and his wife settling in Northwest Woods around the same time. They dug out a hole in a dirt bank, placed a board over it, and called it home till they could build better. <laughs> Captain Hobart's home must have been quite impressive to the average resident of East Hampton. Hobart's title was High Sheriff of the East Riding of Yorkshire, as Suffolk County was called after 1664, when it was under the Duke of York and later King James II. We don't know much about Hobart, but one item of official business he did conduct was the resolution of a property boundary dispute between Southampton and East Hampton. Following Hobart's death in 1711, his home was sold to Samuel Mulford, son of John Mulford, the first settler. The majority of the Mulford's home framing timbers are still intact, enabling scholars to tell the story of the successive changes over time. The house provides an opportunity to study building methods and materials from the 16 and 1700s. In the early 1980s, experts arrived to do a thorough analysis of the bones of the Mulford house. The Mulford House was documented by the Historic American Building Survey and assessed by architectural historian Daniel C. Hopping, as well as Abbott Lowell Cummings of the Venerable Society of the Preservation of New England Antiquities. From their research, these three distinct building episodes were found. The original house, circa 1680, the 1720 house, when a lean-to kitchen was added, and there was the loss of the east side second story. It has been theorized the substantial changes to the roof line after the Mulfords acquired the house may have been the result of a large hurricane in the early 1700s, or it could have been simple neglect and a lack of funds for repairs. The 1750 house shows a restoration to the second floor, an enlargement of the garret or attic. The house we see today is referred to as this 1750 house. In addition to the house's architectural significance, 
antiquity and its importance to the beauty of East Hampton, the home has remained in the Mulford hands for the majority of its existence, giving scholars the opportunity to trace the family, their use of the land, and structures around them. Analysis by Columbia University in the 1980s showed the colonists enjoyed colors like blues and oranges, which were recreated in the house today. The Mulford barn, built in approximately 1721, is a typical English-style barn characterized by an eight-post center-through aisle flanked by open animal stalls beneath haylofts. One of the fun things about history is the stories. The year 1721 is etched in one of the barn rafters. One theory is the date, that's the date the barn was built. But one East Hamptoner told me 1721 was carved into the rafters as a prank by some local boys on a lunch break while working at the site in the 1940s. <laughs> if they'd like to come forward, I have your names. Please let me know if there's any truth to it. The barn support posts measure 13 feet tall and are eight inches square at their base and rest on field stone. The Mulford Farm was an operating farm up until the 1940s. The lean-to barn on the right was added after the barn at an unknown date. The Mulford Barn is the only original salt box barn in East Hampton. It was evaluated by the State Department of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation in 1990. It was deemed the second most important 18th century barn in New York State. There are various outbuildings on the Mulford Farm, most built in the 19th and 20th century. What a magnificent view looking out of the Mulford Barn over to Home Sweet Home. A chicken coop still stands on the grounds. Here chickens are seen on the farm in 1723. I'm sorry, 1923. <laughs> this is a wonderful photo by C. Frank Dayton showing John Mulford on his farm. John was born in 1856 and died at 83 in 1939. On the farm were pigs, ducks, horses, cows, turkeys, and guinea hens, to name a few. Here you can see a person highlighted by the circle carrying two buckets and notice the lawn in full bloom of flowers. The Hedges Edwards Barn is the newest addition to the Mulford Farm. The barn built in 1770 originally stood on the Village Hall property. Moved several times, it was donated to the Historical Society, refurbished and reassembled and unveiled in 2019. Something you don't see anymore today, flowers unobstructed by deer fence. This is the flower garden at Mulford Farm in 1977. Today on the grounds at Mulford Farm is Rachel's Garden, a recreated 18th century dooryard garden. Rachel's Garden was a gift from the Garden Club of East Hampton presented in 1994. It was imagined from the life of Rachel Mulford, a young mother and three small children and a new baby who lived in the house in 1790 with her husband, Major David Mulford. David was one of 66 weavers in this small village of less than 1,500 people. There were several windmills and a church in town, but no food store. Rachel's garden would have supplied the family with food, medicine, and dyes for fabric. Designed and planted by the Garden Club, heirloom seeds and plant varieties traced back to their original strains were used whenever possible. Prior to the installation of Rachel's Garden, the Historical Society commissioned landscape archeologists to survey the site in 1993. What turned up in the garden? Small traces of early life on the farm. Buttons, a glass bead, fragments of clay pipes, a thimble, clay pottery, a bone-handled fork, nails, ceramic pieces, earthenware, creamware, pearlware, and delft, and a large amount of butchered cow and pig bones. <laughs> Most of the items were believed to have come from the late 1700s and early 1800s. Of particular interest to the archeologists were two French coins from 1720 and 1740, and also a quartzite pestle used to grind corn and nuts that was common in colonial kitchens lived on Mulford Farm. The most famous Mulford to live there was Samuel Fishhooks Mulford. I don't think any of you could have escaped hearing who he is. <laughs> he died in 
He was a pre hero in pre-revolutionary America. He fought against the British crown to repeal onerous taxes and won. In this photo, Fishhooks is portrayed by Trevor Kelsaw, accompanied by pickpockets, at the 350th anniversary parade. The parade celebrated the founding of the town of East Hampton was held in 1998. Fishhooks Mulford has been the subject of several university theses. His story played out on radio and even a TV program. Samuel Mulford was a whaling captain and captain in the colonial militia. He served as town trustee and town recorder and built the first warehouse and wharf at Northwest Harbor. Amazingly, his political career did not begin until in his 60s. He was elected one of only two men to represent Eastern Long Island in New York's General Assembly. For the next 15 years, he would work tirelessly to secure fair representation for Suffolk County. He worked to secure a port of entry closer to New England trade routes, closer than New York Harbor. Onerous laws were so complicated, if one inspection item was missed, the government could seize a captain's ship. Mulford argued that every captain needed to be a lawyer to make sense of the regulations. When he refused to retract this speech, he was thrown off the assembly. He returned to the East End, where as only Bonnikers can do, he was promptly re-elected by the townspeople and went back on the General Assembly. <laughs> the issue he became most famous for was fighting against repressive taxes against the important whaling industry. Whale oil was a source of fuel for every household lamp. Under British rule, whales were called royal fish, requiring an expensive license for anyone hunting them. In addition, whalers had to give the crown every 16th barrel of oil and an equal share of bone, and this oil had to be delivered in person to the official royal port in New York City, a time-consuming job for those whalers operating on the east end of Long Island. Getting no result, he was so frustrated, Samuel Mulford sailed to London. He would spend three years there arguing the case. He went before Parliament, then the Board of Trade, and then he wanted to take his argument straight to the King. Standing at the gates one day, he was pickpocketed. He then came up with the idea of sewing fish hooks in his pockets to thwart the pickpockets. <laughs> the next day, while standing at the gates, a cry went out from a pickpocket who had just reached in. The pickpocket was arrested, and the story appeared in local papers. Word got back to the King about the clever gentleman from New York, and it was believed this tactic is what got him an audience with King George I. Samuel Mulford was known as Fishhooks Mulford from then on. Present-day ancestor, Reverend David Mulford, wrote there is debate whether or not this incident ever occurred. But regardless, the story captures the essence of Samuel Mulford. Eventually, the whale taxes were repealed, whales were no longer considered royal fish, requiring expensive licenses, and Sag Harbor was declared an official port of entry. And goods were no longer required to go through the corrupt custom officials in the city. This coat is believed to have belonged to Colonel David Mulford, Fishhook's grandson. Just last month, textile expert Lynn Bassett was brought in to assess the Historical Society's textile collection. She took these pictures, calling this coat a rare and fabulous survivor from the American Revolutionary period, a red wool broadcloth coat. The huge brass buttons were the height of fashion in the 1780s. This was an expensive coat belonging to a wealthy person. The fabric would have cost a working man's wages for a year. Known as a scarlet coat, so similar to the British Redcoats' military uniforms, some might think Mulford a loyalist to the British, but that was apparently not the case. Red was a popular color, and this was an impressive coat. No more, no less. Jason Nower, another textile expert, authenticated the coat some years back, and has a 30-minute YouTube video about this very coat, calling it a national treasure. What was happening at Mulford Farm during the American Revolution? In 1774, in response to increasing hostilities at the Boston port, and a fear that the British would come to East Hampton for their large stock of cattle and sheep grazing at Montauk, a Suffolk militia was organized with Colonel David Mulford leading the regiment. Colonel Mulford was the owner of the Scarlet Coat. He was elected to represent the town at the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia. Here, the Articles of Association were drafted. By signing the articles, an individual was pledging loyalty to the colonies. In East Hampton, every able-bodied man signed the Articles of Association. 
After independence was declared on July 4th, 1776, the Battle of Long Island played out in the Brooklyn area. This battle was a signal to Americans that victory was not going to come easy. The Continental Army, after various setbacks under the direction of General George Washington, surrendered New York to the British Army in August 1776. East Hampton would be left to languish behind enemy lines for the next seven years. The Mulford House weathered through the British occupation of East Hampton from 1776 to 1783. Residents of Long Island, now under British rule, were required to give an oath of allegiance to the Crown. In one story, Colonel Mulford initially refused to give this oath. The British troops surrounded the Mulford House. He was threatened with imprisonment. He signed. Fearing reprisals to New York citizens who had signed the earlier Articles of Association, the New York Provincial Congress encouraged residents to flee to Connecticut, taking their families, slaves, servants, belongings, and livestock with them. 171 local East Hampton families fled their homes. Colonel Mulford was one of the group who became known as the refugees of 1776, fleeing to Connecticut. He died in Connecticut of smallpox, never to return home to East Hampton. His son, Major David Mulford, was believed to have stayed Mulford Farm through the occupation. The last of the British departed in 1783. Those returning home to East Hampton found a desolate landscape, their livestock gone, fields and woodlands in shambles, and their houses run down. In the early 1980s, the Historical Society brought in Timothy Breen, a history professor, to research East Hampton's history from an outsider's perspective. Professor Breen learned that in early 1700s, Suffolk County had the largest population of African Americans in the New York colony, with the exception of New York City. In 1687, an East Hampton census listed just less than 5% enslaved African Americans. In 1698, African Americans represented 21% of the population of Suffolk County. With no plantations or labor-intensive economies, most worked as domestic servants. Documents associated with slavery in East Hampton are on display through the end of the month right here at the East Hampton Library. The exhibit displays documentary evidence of the presence of hundreds of black slaves owned by wealthy local residents, including some of the region's fa founding families. The exhibit displays this runaway ad placed by John Mulford in July 1773 for a man named Prince that he enslaved in East Hampton. It's hard to pin down facts and evidence when it comes to slavery in East Hampton, but in the case of the Mulford Farm, there are numerous sources over different periods of time offering specific evidence of slavery at the farm. The Plain Sight Project works to identify enslaved persons. They have found records for enslaved persons on Mulford Farm named Shafar and Sharper in 1723, Rose in 1724, Joe in 1764, Abigail 1773, Prince and his son Depp in 1779. The late Jeanette Rattray, editor of the Star, wrote in 1945 that the Mulford House had two attics and two sets of stairs, the back stairs leading to the slaves' room. She wrote East Hampton had slaves till New York freed them in the 1820s. The last African-American woman to work at Mulford Farm was named Zilpha. She was believed to be a descendant of slaves and was still well remembered there in 1945. A new church in town. A historic meeting occurred at Mulford Farm in 1715 to discuss building the second town church. The larger church shown here was built two years later where Pondview Lane and Guildhall are today. Over the Mulford's long history on the farm, they would occasionally rent out the property. One Mulford widow, unable to afford the upkeep, rented the property for 15 years, ending in 1831, to the minister of the town church, Reverend Ebenezer Phillips. The farmland was rented to Jeremiah and Samuel Miller. The Phillips' only daughter is believed to have been born on Mulford Farm in 1815. After Reverend Phillips left in 1831, the Mulford Farm briefly came out of the Mulford family. It was sold to Zephania Hedges. His son, Judge Henry P. Hedges, recalls begrudgingly leaving his childhood home on Wainscott Pond to move to East Hampton to be closer to his new school, Clinton Academy. Legend has it the boys attending Clinton Academy took their meals at the Mulford House. 
In 1949, an elderly woman wrote a letter to the Star detailing her memories boarding as a child at the Mulford Farm. She wrote, in 1869, great were the pleasures of farm and ocean after life in the city. Mr. and Mrs. Mulford were kindly souls. The picket fence was lined with flocks, as it was Mrs. Mulford's favorite flower. How well I remember the windmill, the pond, and the procession, procession of geese. Every morning, we drove to the beach over a long and dusty road in an open carriage drawn by two horses. Several wooden pails, painted yellow, were tied on a trunk rack on the back of the carriage. Every bathhouse had one of these pails, filled with water, and the wet suits were brought back in them. Then the hours on the beach and its wonderful surf. Young as I was, I appreciated and loved it. Then the drive back stopping in a farmhouse across the way for a glass of buttermilk. In spite of more than 80 years, it all comes back one of many happy experiences in a long, happy life. Amazingly, the Mulford House has stood barely unaltered for all these years. Electricity has never been installed. Running water was never piped in. There has never been a toilet inside of the Mulford House. Here are the last three generations of Mulfords to live on Mulford Farm. John Henry Mulford, his son Josiah Mulford, and his son Harrison Mulford. Grandfather John was born at Mulford Farm in 1856 and died there in 1939 at the age of 83. He had lost his wife years earlier and resided at the farm with his son Josiah. Josiah was divorced. Harrison spent time living with his mother on Egypt Lane and on the farm with his father, Josiah. Five years after Grandpa Mulford died, his son, Josiah Lester Mulford died, age 54, in November of 1944. His obituary in the Star said for many years, he and his father lived alone together in the picturesque old house overlooking the village green. He farmed his own land until his declining health caused his retirement. He was a member of the Presbyterian Church and the East Hampton Fire Department. John Harrison Mulford, known as Harrison, was the last of his family line to be born on the Mulford farm in 1910. The only child of Josiah and Bessie King Mulford, the eighth generation Mulford to own the property. Harrison was also a Montauk cowboy. He was a riding instructor at Deep Hollow Ranch. He participated in the recreation of a cattle drive to Montauk in 1937. He participated in Montauk rodeos and was a member of the South Fork Trailblazers. He would also ride the summer people's horses at jumping competitions in New York City. He was an announcer at horse shows. Fox hunts were also held at Mulford Farm, the property then extending back the 13 acres to Hook Pond. The fox let go on the farm and the chase would begin. In 1932, Harrison married Dorothy Earle. Dorothy was born in Brooklyn. She had a difficult childhood. Her father died before she was born, and her mother was disabled in a falling elevator accident. She was shipped around to family and then turned over as an orphan to the Children's Aid Society. As a young girl under 10, she was placed with the Frank W. and Sarah Parsons family of Amagansett who were looking for a young girl to help with chores around the house. After attending Amagansett and East Hampton High School, she attended nurses' school at Southampton Hospital and was an RN practicing nursing in East Hampton for over 20 years, mainly tending to people in their homes and working for Dr. David Baker. Dorothy is shown here on the right in 1984 at the Mulford Farm, modeling an heirloom Mulford wedding dress from the 1880s. Dorothy, the last Mulford bride to live in the Mulford house, recalled, recalled the early years of her marriage in the 1930s. She said the house had never had electricity or plumbing, the feather beds still warmed by soapstones. The Mulfords grew all the feed for their farm animals themselves. The Mulfords would have three children, John H. in 1932 and John R. in 1934, both boys sadly dying at birth. Their daughter, Margaret Louise, known as Peggy Lou Mulford, was born in 1940, and Peggy Lou is still living in Florida today. In the 1930s, after their marriage, they lived for a few years in the Mulford house with Harrison's father and grandfather, 
Most of the time, they lived in a small old house owned by the Mulfords near the entrance to today's Pondview Lane, next to the old McCann's Meat Market, a building also owned by the Mulfords. The Mulfords owned all the land on today's Pondview Lane as well. Dorothy was active in the Ladies' Village Improvement Society and the Guildhall Players, where she would act in local productions. Dorothy Mulford is seen here with Harrison's mother, Betty King Mulford Osborne, and Betty's second husband, Gardner Osborne. Preparing for this talk, after seeing a picture of Dorothy Mulford in the wedding dress, I realized I knew Dorothy Mulford. We both attended the First Presbyterian Church of East Hampton. I recall her as being a smart looking woman, beautifully attired. When I went to look up this picture in the 1968 church directory, Lo and behold, there we were, side by side. <laughs> I recall Dorothy always with perfectly coiffed white hair. I, however, was apparently sporting some home-cut bangs at the time. <laughs> in a short time, Harrison's grandfather died in 1939, then his father in 1944. By 1945, Harrison Mulford owned the Mulford Homestead, a home in need of major repairs. Reportedly, the two older men did not make taking care of the house a priority, and as many farm farmers are, they were land rich but cash poor. In April 1945, the editor of the Star, Jeanette Rattray, asked Harrison Mulford for a tour of the house. As her son, young Everett Rattray, was doing a school report on old houses, he had read that plaster walls were made of clamshells and cow hair and wanted to know if this was true. Harrison Mulford didn't like to give tours of the house. One reason was a 300-year-old plaster ceiling had recently collapsed. He consented to the tour, giving a piece of the collapsed ceiling to Everett, who could indeed see the cow hairs as clear as if they were added yesterday. The kitchen still had the butter churn that Harrison worked as a boy, and on the floor, Jeanette wrote lay a striped carpet weaved by Native Americans. Jeanette reported that Harrison, his father, and his grandfather were regularly pestered to death by curiosity seekers who would knock on the door hoping for a chance to see the house. Harrison was a tall six foot two, seen on the right smoking a pipe. His wife said he had 35 pipes. <laughs> the East Hampton Historical Society is the owner of the Mulford Farm property today. What happened back in the 1940s, 75 years ago? How did it come to be that the privately owned property of Harrison and Dorothy Mulford transferred to the Historical Society? Was it a simple transaction, a family leaving their house to the Historical Society? No. <laughs> Let's see. In July 1945, the LVIS held a parade to celebrate their 50th anniversary. Young Peggy Lou Mulford, pictured here, rode her pony in the parade. Her mom, Dorothy Mulford, holds the reins. On the world stage, World War II was raging. 19 days after this photo was taken, Japan would surrender, bringing an end to the war. A month after the parade, September 1945, the Mulfords began repairs on the home. They were afraid the next hurricane would take the house down with it. Harrison repaired the outbuildings and added some farm animals. He replaced the picket fence at the front of the park property. Apparently, the previous fence was quite dilapidated, and the Star reported the townspeople were delighted to see a new fence and fresh improvements being made. They cleaned out the attic, possibly for the first time in a century, some said. The Star reported they threw out a wagon load of moth-destroyed clothing stored in ancient trunks. The operation was overseen by Morton Pennypacker, who took important books, letters, and documents to the East Hampton Library. Harrison and Dorothy Mulford then removed all the furniture they wished to keep and held a two-day sale on October 4th and 5th, 1945. Now that's a sale I would have liked to have been at. I wonder if more people came to finally get a peek in the old house or if they came in hopes of buying a Mulford heirloom. In 1945, a victorious feeling was about town with the end of the World War II. However, changes in the community were underway. The Dominey shops on North Main Street were sold, the center of the building torn down, and a parking lot to go in its place. At the same time, news was out that the sheepfold in front of the village post office was to be sold. A gas station was proposed. 
Mrs. William Carter Dickerman would step in and purchase the sheepfold property, saving it as the landmark it is today. Did the Mulfords decide now to sell to the Historical Society? No. Everyone was taken aback when they heard rumors that the Mulford house was, be, was to be demolished. Harrison Mulford wanted to build a new home on the site. No one could imagine a new home in the center of the village historic district. In November 1945, the, I think the sound went out. In November 1945, the LVIS was moved to take an unprecedented step of making an offer on the property. The Mulfords entered into an agreement to sell the Mulford house to the LVIS for the sum of $5,000. Under this arrangement, the property would continue to be owned by the Mulford family, the LVIS would have a lease of three years and the right to remove the house from the property. Three weeks after the agreement was drafted, the Mulfords changed their mind. In a letter to then LVIS president, Michelle Bouvier Scott, Dorothy Mulford said they could not part with it. They now plan to repair it and make it a home again. Dorothy Mulford, a member of the LVIS, was present at the LVIS meeting when the new course of action was announced. She thanked the LVIS for making the family aware of what they were going to give away. She assured them the house would be restored in a fitting manner. Harrison Mulford had abandoned his plans to demolish the old house, and he would abandon his plans to build new. In 1946, however, he realized he was not selling Mulford Farm, nor was the house suitable to live in, yet he needed to pay the property's upkeep. He came up with the idea of a riding academy. He reportedly invested a large sum of money to add on to the barn and announced the opening of a riding academy in April of 1946. In this photo, the sign marked with the arrows says Mulford Riding Academy. Harrison bought 17 horses. Both he and his wife Dorothy would give riding lessons, Harrison Western Riding and Dorothy English Riding. Dorothy Mulford said the property at the time went all the way to Hook Pond. The field they gave riding lessons on behind the barn was the size of Madison Square Garden. Some neighbors were not happy about the stable. A commercial enterprise on a residential property in East Hampton Village? Hmm. For the next year, the powers that be debated Harrison Mulford's property rights. The village came out squarely against him. No riding academy. Elevated to a Supreme Court justice at Riverhead, it was ruled the Riding Academy was non-conforming and his business had to cease. Then, in a move that confused most, the case was brought back before a local body. Harrison Mulford asked the East Hampton Zoning Board of Appeals for a variance. The local appeals board ruled he could have a five-year variance to operate a Riding Academy. Furious, the village and its mayor, Judge Bannister, sued to overturn the appeals decision. The case then went before a Supreme Court justice in Nassau County. That judge affirmed the appeals board's decision. Harrison Mulford would be given a five-year variance to run a riding academy on his ancestral land. It was ruled that the property with a building over 100 years old could not yield a reasonable rate of return if it was used only for the purposes allowed in a residential zone. The court found the owner was in the unique and unusual position of finding himself with an ancient homestead with old buildings without modern improvements. After their contentious local zoning battle, the Mulfords spent the winter in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> By April 1947, on the return to East Hampton, Harrison decided to sell off his horses and equipment and discontinue the riding academy after less than a year. His health was deteriorating. He sold all the horses at once, which his wife, Dorothy, said broke her heart. Two years after their first attempt, the Mulfords again began discussions to sell the Mulford farm. Did the Mulfords decide to sell to the Historical Society? No. <laughs> the Mulfords again offered the Mulford farm to the LVIS in the fall of 1947. 
with a new price tag of $40,000. This offer was rejected by the LVIS. At the same time, on the 12th of December, 1947, Harrison and Dorothy Mulford hosted the wedding of Harrison's divorced mother, Bessie King Mulford, age 57, to widow Gardner Osborne, age 67, at their home on Main Street. Within days of the wedding and a month after their offer was rejected by the LVIS, Harrison and Dorothy Mulford very quietly entered into agreement on December 15th with the Brooklyn Museum. For $27,500, the Mulfords agreed to sell two rooms of the house to the museum. The remainder of the house would be torn down. The museum would disassemble the house, taking two of the main colonial rooms back for display at the Brooklyn Museum. They were particularly interested in the interior woodwork and exposed beams and wanted to display the two rooms as an example of colonial architecture. It was apparently several months before the townspeople learned of this agreement. The following year, 1948, was the 300th anniversary of the town of East Hampton. Elaborate plans were underway to celebrate the town's history. It was to be a summer like no other. The committee of the 300th anniversary celebration and its chairman, Ralph Frude, wrote a letter to the museum trying to determine if the rumors were true and asked them not to tear down the Mulford house and remove the rooms right when the pageantry of the village would be taking place on the green. They did not want festivities to be marred by such a painful operation. <laughs> For three days at the end of August 1947, the Mulfords held another sale at Mulford Farm to liquidate the contents of the house. In April 1948, in a letter to the Star, a writer explained a plan to save the house, exactly as it is, no museum, no electricity or plumbing, to be maintained as an example of how our ancestors set up their houses and farms in the 1600s, and the place maintained wholly as a picture and to delight the eye. The writer continued, no other village or town in America could equal such an untouched example of a 17th century farmhouse as we would have in our very midst. It would be unthinkable that any community could possibly prefer a hole in the ground, a monument to our indifference, and the 300-year-old farm cut up into lots for modern dwellings. In the middle of anniversary celebratory preparations, the LVIS, the Garden Club, and the East Hampton League were able to bring the Mulford Farm to a public referendum. A petition was circulated on May 17, 1948, to require the village of East Hampton to add the proposition to purchase the Mulford Farm to the June 1948 ballot. The sales price, $27,500. What the Star described as the most spirited village election ever, <laughs> Mayor Judson Bannister was re-elected and the proposition to buy the Mulford Farm was defeated, two to one. 315 people were against the purchase and 163 in favor. Voters did agree, however, to spend 6,500 on a new fire truck. The more one learns about history, you realize history always repeats itself. This past week, the village approved a half million dollar bond for the Domini shops and a $4.6 million bond for fire trucks. <laughs> While public support for the purchase of Mulford Farm seemed strong, the voters rejected the proposition days before the start of the 300th celebration, ironically celebrating the town's history. While everyone was upset at the prospect of losing the old homestead, it reportedly was Miss M Harry Hamlin, also known as Mary, Mary Paxton Hamlin, who lit the fires to save the Mulford Farm. With the LVIS support, Mrs. Hamlin, Mrs. J. Edwards Gay Jr., and Mrs. Percy Skank paid a deposit and secured an option to purchase the Mulford Farm from Harrison Mulford. They were given two weeks to raise the money to buy the home. And as luck would have it, an LVIS member was also on the board of the Brooklyn Museum. After bending her ear, they secured the museum's support to release their contract on the Mulford House if responsible parties in East Hampton could be found to purchase and preserve it. I find these women's quick thinking, strategizing, and willingness to legally enter in a purchase action to be quite remarkable considering it was the 1940s, a time when women were only known by their husband's name, when few career paths were open to women, these women stepped up and got her done. 
Mrs. Hamlin was described as a dynamo of energy who did a great deal for East Hampton. Mary was instrumental in purchasing Home Sweet Home 20 years earlier. She enjoyed purchasing and refurbishing many of the most notable houses in East Hampton, Stony Hill Farm and Miss Amelia's Cottage in Amagansett, Rowdy Hall, Gansett House, and the Hedges Inn. Along with a group, she also once owned the Sea Spray Inn for a time. Helen Semple Amadin Gay became a partner with her son in the Amadin Gay Insurance Agency after the death of her second husband. Long active in civil affairs, civic affairs, she was involved with Guild Hall since its start and with the LVIS where she was a secretary for many years. Mrs. Hallie Skank was described as a leader in East Hampton civic affairs and wife of Percy Skank who founded the Skank Fuel Oil Company here in town. Some of you may have known their son, the late Kennel or Ken Skank and his wife Ginny pictured on the right. In June, after voters turned down the proposition, realizing there was no time for the collection of small donations, three members of the East Hampton Historical Society, Percy Ingalls, John Cole, and H. Jack Jackson Stark sprung into action. They quietly secured the money before the option expired. Forty initial contributors, all from the Maidstone Club, contributed over $30,000 within 10 days for the purchase and preservation of the old house. Mary Paxton was reported to have gone from Beach Cabana to Beach Cabana at the Maidstone Club collecting money. <laughs> The newspapers reported the historic farm was saved for, prosperity, for posterity. A 1948 editorial said, one day people will be glad the Mulford home remained intact and was not torn down and partly carried away to Brooklyn, leaving an ugly <coughs> hole in the ground. The Mulford farm is part of the vista that gives East Hampton its unique historical character. Another 1948 editorial stated, the village green and its setting will look the same to our grandchildren as it does today. It is something unique, something every visitor exclaims about. It is something peaceful and homey and good to grow up with. The plan at the time was always for the LVIS to run the Mulford Farm. The last twist in the tale is that the LVIS had no officially recognized tax-free status. So the ownership of the Mulford Farm was turned over to, you guessed it, the Historical Society, with the understanding they would then lease the building to the LVIS, the grounds to be used for the annual LVIS fair and the barns for LVIS storage. On August 29, 1948, the East Hampton Historical Society received the deed to the Mulford Farm. Clifford Edwards, pictured on the left, did the legal work on the purchase. Next is Percy Ingalls, who led the effort for the Historical Society. After a brief acceptance speech, Samuel Ed Hedges, President of the Historical Society, presents a lease to Mrs. Russell Hopkinson, President of the LVIS. The Mulford family stands on the right, Harrison and Dorothy Mulford and daughter Peggy Lou. On the far right is Saul Wolfe, a member of the Historical Society. Against all odds, the Mulford house was saved, keeping intact the historic heart of the village. The Mulfords immediately headed off on a seven-week car trip across the country to California. <laughs> Dorothy Mulford said Harrison was sick 15 of the 27 years they were married, with pulmonary fibrosis, an untreatable illness of the lungs. He was known to be a heavy smoker. After the sale of the homestead, the Mulfords would live on Main Street, Mill Hill Lane, and build a house on Meadow Way. Harrison died 11 years after the sale of Mulford Farm at the age of 48. Harrison's wife, Dorothy Mulford, is seen here in 1999 showing off Fishhooks Mulford's walking stick at her home in Southampton. In 1981, she married again to widow Albert S.A. Sr. of Southampton, well known for his Albert S.A. Ice Cream Company. She lived till 94 years of age and always happily gave talks on her memories at Mulford Farm. Oh, that gondola. <laughs> what do a Venetian gondola and the Mulford Farm have in common? Well, the East Hampton Library had received Thomas Moran's gondola through his daughter Ruth Moran's will that year of 1948. The library, with no place to store the boat, had it out back here under a tarp. They quickly saw an opportunity to loan the boat to the LVIS and store it at Mulford Farm. So as soon as the ink was dry on the deal at Mulford Farm, the gondola was on its way. 
seen here being towed over to Mulford Farm in October 1948. By 1950, when the LVIS rejected an offer to take the gondola, the library loaded the 36-foot gondola on a train at the East Hampton Railroad Station. After 60 years in East Hampton, it was headed to the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia. The gondola was spotted by artist Thomas Moran on a trip to Venice and purchased in 1890. He brought the boat to the U.S. on the deck of an ocean liner, then by boat to Sag Harbor, and then to East Hampton on a specially designed cart. The family would occasionally be seen sailing in the gondola on Hook Pond. And for two years, the gondola was stored at the Mulford Farm. Who knew? <laughs> Over at the farm, work immediately began to shore up and stabilize the Mulford House. Only the best were brought in to oversee the restoration and return the home to its colonial appearance. Renowned architect Amir Embury oversaw the work. He had a home in East Hampton. Embury is pictured here at his 80th birthday party in East Hampton with his wife Jane and friends Cam and Ed Jewett. Singleton Moorhead, a respected restoration architect associated with Colonial Williamsburg, also guided the restoration work. In 1952, the front of the Mulford House was in dire need of new shingles, but no one wanted to put new shingles on the Mulford House. John Cole of the Building Committee at the Historical Society purchased the old Talmadge Barn on North Main Street, the shingles used on the Mulford Farm. The Star reported that Norman Quarty took the shingles off that barn and did a fine job putting them on the front of the Mulford House. After the restoration work, with great fanfare, the Mulford House was open to the public in July 1955. Mrs. Edwin Sherrill and Mrs. Newt Tiffany, shown above in colonial dress, greeted the first guests who were Mulford descendants who traveled in for the occasion. Here is a photo of the 1950s interpretation of a room at Mulford Farm. Now the Mulford's Colonial House was open for everyone to have a look. Manette Hobart Loomis was the second wife of physicist Alfred Loomis. She was active in the Historical Society at the time. Her husband Alfred created Loomis Laboratories in Tuxedo Park, New York. His contributions, along with an assembled group of renowned scientists in the field of radar and the atom bomb, are credited in helping end World War II. He and Manette retired to their house on David's Lane in 1947. And Cheryl Roy Durstein and Manette Loomis here toured the home. Pictured here, Historical Society member Roy Durstein checking out a Mulford telescope. In the 1950s, the townspeople rallied donating or loaning heirloom furniture to the Mulford House Museum. George Baker Strong, pictured here, was related to William Mulford. He supervised the collection and placement of furniture pieces in the house. Richard Corwin and Frank Eldridge assisted. After the purchase of Mulford Farm, the LVIS would move their fare from the village green to the Mulford Farm. Many of you most likely have fond memories of the LVIS's summer fair at Mulford Farm. Above is a stagecoach ride at the 1964 fair, and below the fair booths lined up on the farm lawn in 1963. An LVIS fashion show in the shadows of Home Sweet Home Windmill in 1962. This is a wonderful photo by Eunice Juckett of the fairground entrance to Mulford Farm, most likely in the 1940s or 1950s. The LVIS Fair would be held at Mulford Farm for 40 years, from 1949 through 1989. Here the lunch sign says a sandwich was 10 cents and iced coffee 20 cents. The last LVIS Fair was held at Mulford Farm 33 years ago. Santa visited Mulford Farm at the 2020 Historical Society of Glow event. We hope you'll visit too. The Mulford Farm will be open each week during the summer, so if you haven't had a chance to stop by, please do so. And thanks to a generous donation from Sotheby's International Realty, 
They are an exclusive sponsor of our free admission initiative and there are no admission fees at any historical society sites this year. While we can't interview our ancestors, we can go back in time to the American Revolutionary years and visit the type of house our ancestors may have lived in. As Hugh King said, how lucky are we to have such a treasure right here in our own town. Thank you for coming out tonight. so long ago. They were coming as far away from as Huntington to get a blacksmith and they just didn't stay. Are there other accounts of um, you know interaction between LBIS and the Historical Society? Are there other interactions? Um, yeah, yeah. I think they were pretty constant and um, continue to be and with the Garden Club as well. Um, the Garden Club maintains all the gardens at the Historical Society. And the gardens, there's gardens behind Clinton Academy, the Moran House, and Mulford Farm, and they're open all the time. So even if the museum isn't open, I encourage you to come see these beautiful gardens. So we definitely, it's a small town, we have a relationship with the LVIS. And the Garden Club. And the Garden Club, yes. <laughs> Did anyone else know Dorothy Mulford? A few. She was with Dr. Baker? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you.